Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Evan, welcome back. I've heard nothing has happened in the Red Wings and hockey world. So it should be a quick and clean episode. A whole franchise has moved since you've been gone. Yes. The Red Wings have left and re-entered the playoff race 15 times. I, you know what? I didn't even try and like decipher what the way in now looks like. I'm just going to go and let everybody else figure it out. You just tell me how to feel. <laughs> And that's what I'm going to do. I'm calling Gary Bettman and saying, look, I understand the standings in the, the matchups don't change too much if you go to a one versus eight system. But please, my friend Evan, he's very sick. He can't understand this. His brain hurts. It's too many folds over here. It's way too much. Uh, it's really great that that photographer got the picture of you and Tiger shaking hands today. But it's a shame they got that tree in the way. But that must have been a cool moment. Yeah, I guess the National is actually going to remove that tree now <laughs> by request. <laughs> Folks, what a wild two games where at different points you might have gotten pretty much every range of emotions possible from any of us three. But the Red Wing, we're now talking about the Red Wings in our last episode before the conclusion of the regular season where games 81 and potentially 82 are relevant. The playoff hopes are still alive and it was by a thread last night and now it's a, a little bit more solid than that but maybe solid is not the right word to use anyhow welcome to the winged wheel podcast here to talk to you about all things detroit red wings hockey the world of the nhl and its moving franchises in this playoff race i'm one of your hosts ryan Hanna. i'm brad crisco and i'm evan on this episode of the winged wheel podcast we're actually going to lead with an explanation of the standings and, and just what detroit needs to make the playoffs or what could happen as they play these last two games against montreal and then we're going to talk about the two games that got them here surprisingly, which included a dropped game against Pittsburgh and a miraculous win against Toronto. We're going to be talking about storylines from those games, standout players, Lucas Raymond continuing to just be Lucas Raymond, putting the team almost entirely on his back. Other notes on the Red Wings, players like Kane, Nate Danielson as a prospect, and then the Arizona to Utah saga continues as it looks to be all but confirmed. So more news out of there before we get into some NHL news and then overtime where we take your questions. Before all that, I want to let you know that this podcast is almost entirely supported by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to join the so-called dub dub club, you get access to some really great benefits. For example, you're automatically entered into all of our giveaways. This past season, we gave away two tickets to every Red Wings home game, the vast majority going directly to our Patreon supporters. You also get access to our bonus overtime episodes, which record right after these main ones. Additionally, you get access to our Patreon exclusive winged wheel podcast discord. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to go the extra mile and support the show, it's what makes this whole thing happen. So it really means a lot to us. The Red Wings have two games left. One at home on Monday night against Montreal and one on the road on Tuesday night in Montreal. So it's a home and home back to back, which is going to be exceptionally tough for the team to, you know, get the most out of themselves. But at this time in the year, it doesn't matter what's tough, strength of schedule, who you're playing, any of that. It's about getting it done. Still, Detroit doesn't control their own destiny. They need the Washington Capitals to drop one point, which is to say they need the Washington Capitals in their next two games to lose one of them in any fashion. And they play Philly, which is particularly interesting as well, right? Because Philly's also chasing that final spot. Yes, which means between Philadelphia and Washington, one of them is guaranteed to get to 89 points at a minimum. Philly has one game left, so 89 is their maximum. Washington could get to 91, theoretically, as a maximum. But even if they lose their one game and they win against Philly, their other game, they get to 89 points. Detroit doesn't hold the regulation wins first tiebreaker against Washington or Philly or Pittsburgh, for that matter. So Detroit, no matter what, over these next two games, has to take a minimum of three points and get to 90 if they want to make the playoffs. That is non-negotiable. Washington's last two games, Monday night is against Boston. They are at home, so Boston's on the road. And then the Philly-Washington game is in Philly. So here are the paths in. The main one, as you were saying pre-podcast, Brad, why don't you outline that? There's, as I mentioned, a lot of paths, but the simplest one, and if the Red Wings are going to make it, the most likely one. You win out, 
four points, Washington loses a game. Yeah, Philly, Pittsburgh, and the Islanders could all still factor in here, but if we're just talking odds, statistics, what's likely to happen, if those teams start to factor in, it probably went way off the rails for Detroit, Yes, so it's not likely to matter. Outpace Washington in these final two games, and you're in. Full stop. Here's how the Islanders could potentially come into play. Right now, they hold that third divisional seat in the Metro, 90 points, two games left. They have 27 regulation wins. If they lose their last two games like flat out in regulation and they don't get a single other point, they could potentially drop down to the wild card spot if, say, Washington passes them or Pittsburgh passes them, whatever it might be, because Pittsburgh would have the tiebreaker and Washington could get to 91 points. Then if Detroit has 90 alongside the Islanders, they, if they get one more regulation win, then they would hold that over the Islanders. So the Islanders have 90 points, two games left, 27 regulation wins. That's the only team where Detroit can catch them on the tiebreaker. Washington's in the second wild card playoff spot right now, two games left, 87 points, 30 regulation wins. Detroit is the first team outside of the wild card positions, two games left, 87 points, same amount of points, only 27 regulation wins. Philly, 87 points, one game left. So their theoretical maximum is 89 compared to Detroit and Washington's 91. And the Pittsburgh Penguins, after losing last night in regulation, are at 86 points, two games left. So their theoretical maximum is 90. It gets complicated because Detroit's competing for one spot. The tiebreaker is different depending on if we're talking about the teams currently in the wild card race compared to the Islanders, who Detroit could actually factor into the tiebreaker. But Detroit can't compete for that Metro Division spot, but the Islanders could drop out of that Metro Division spot. It's a whole Charlie from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia looking at the string board saying, like, Carol, like, it's a whole thing. I'm not saying this is why I absolutely want to go back to the one verse eight system, but it certainly would be an advantage. It makes things a lot simpler for fans. It would help my monkey brain for sure. Yeah, yeah. The simple way to think about the Islanders, if they win one game, they don't factor into the wild card at all. Because none of the teams could catch them. That's right. Detroit has an avenue here. Like, the, it's not guaranteed, and I don't even want to say, li- I think statistically it's one of the likelier avenues uh, across all those wildcard teams, but... You're really going to say any that something is likely, given what you've seen the past month? You can't bank on anything for certain in a positive direction or a negative direction for any of these teams in the wildcard race right now. Plain and simple. It is every single period has been unpredictable compared to the last. I mean, we're going to talk about the Toronto game in a moment here. First period, you looked at it and said, okay, all Detroit has to do now is sell out and protect James Reimer. And after the second period, we were talking, wow, if Detroit loses in regulation, that is their playoff hopes officially over. And I think a lot of people would have made that bet based on how that game was going. And then Lark, and then there's a penalty at the end of the game. And then you're like, oh my God, Patrick Kane, what did you just do? And then Max Domi practically saved the Red Wings season. Like every minute compared to the last is the least predictable thing possible. If you're betting on this right now, you are a certified psycho. Like that is just 100% s- sicko behavior. Last episode before the season's over. So this is our last opportunity to be optimistic about potential playoff berths. How do you guys feel right now about Detroit's chances based on who they're playing, when they're playing, what they need to happen with Washington and how the Red Wings are performing right now? Well, to kind of branch off what Evan was saying, how do I feel about what's going to happen around the Red Wings? Pretty good. A lot of these teams have lost a lot of very crucial games. The Capitals are playing the Bruins. The Bruins still have something to play for in that game tomorrow. I don't hate the Capitals' odds of dropping a point. Now, if you ask me, do I have any confidence in the Red Wings collecting four points? Also, no, because we've seen them drop two games to Arizona. We've seen them blow a four-goal lead to San Jose. We've seen them have the 30th best record in the NHL since the beginning of March. Is that? Seriously, is it 30th? They put it on on Hockey Night in Canada last night. Mm, Yeah, Very cool. So, (laughs) is Montreal a good team? No. Does Montreal have an advantage in these two games? No, because they're both doing the same travel schedule. Do I have any faith that that matters at all? No, not even a little. It's the Red Wings. I don't know who's going to show up. I was joking with you before the podcast. I have my prediction because I think Detroit's going to walk onto their home ice tomorrow against Montreal and they're going to beat them. And I think the Bruins are going to smoke the Capitals. 
And then I think Detroit's going to blow it on Tuesday. <laughs> and then Washington's going to win because they can't make it simple for us. I'm only half joking when I say that. Yeah. It's mostly in jest, but everybody listening knows there's a little bit of truth behind it. Yeah. <laughs> Every outcome is possible. The doomerism is all we can do to cope sometimes. Like <laughs> you, you, This is an all-time high for Gallo's humor if you're a Red Wings fan because there still is mathematically hope. The thing that's been happening is every time we talk about playoff odds and then, you know, the Red Wings blow a 4-1 lead to Toronto, which thank goodness they didn't actually in the end because that would have been annoying. But the – Every time we talk about these playoff odds, people reach out and they say, oh, they just blew that lead. Why are you even talking about the playoffs? This isn't realistic. You know, this sucks. Look what they just did. And like the Red Wings did just, you know, they blew up all over the ice and it was terrible. And, you know, whatever happened where they lost a key game and you still have to go out there. And I'm saying, hey, look, I'm covering this team and I'm telling you as much as it's it doesn't align with the way you think about the Red Wings right now. For whatever reason that only the hockey gods know, they are still mathematically in this because everyone else around them is doing the exact same damn thing. The only team that has looked by and large good over this stretch is Pittsburgh, and that's because they had to be good to claw their way back into it because the leading pack wasn't leading. They took a nap in the middle of the racetrack. It is the weirdest feeling race. And I'll say this, like, if 90 points gets you in or 89 points gets you in, bizarro year, in reality, you're you're the furthest thing from a playoff team, but it counts, so you'll take it whoever it is. If it's 89, it can't be the Red Wings. This is so unlikely to happen again. I think Derek Lalone was talking before. He was saying, like, it's not just not going to shake out this way. It's not going to happen this way very often. Teams aren't going to fail in this stretch of the year. And not only that, there are, like, the New Jerseys of the league where they should have been more competitive. They're not going to suck again like this next year. So... While we're living in this twilight zone, you know, simulation, let's just enjoy it. Two games left against the Montreal Canadiens. Lane Hudson's going to make his debut. If you try to predict these storylines, you're insane. At the very least, it's going to be entertaining. I know a lot of people are very up and down emotionally on this. And, you know, that's 100% fair. But, you know, think about where we were this time last year, the year before, the year before, the year before, the year before. (laughs) And... I wouldn't if you could tr- count, you would have gone longer. Yeah, if I could. You know what? Given where we've been in, in our history, I will take this, the chaos, well over already being into the second, maybe third round of prospect profiles at this point. So, you know what? When we do our dissection of the season, I will take what's happening right now over the ladder. We've had prospect profile on the docket for like three or four of these episodes, and we've had to take it off. And that's a great it's feeling. It's game time decision every episode, <laughs> it feels like. Oh, God. We, I don't feel – I'm the same as you, Brad. I don't feel necessarily a certainty that the Red Wings are going to pull out these four points. I think you'd be crazy to say that it's going to happen for sure. I think they have the talent and the ability to do it. It's going to probably rest on the shoulders of Lion and or Reimer. But – yeah. <laughs> that was a visceral noise. But – I also am con- as as unconfident in the other teams around him. So we'll see how it plays out. How did the Red Wings get here? Well, they had a must-win game against the Pittsburgh Penguins. And I, you could pick any one of the following things changing just one time. The referees missing a blatant, by the book, on camera, in 8K video, multi-angle we heard the referee's thoughts and and Pedersen's thoughts in the moment penalty a trip on Lucas Raymond that just wasn't called the same play Pittsburgh went and scored Daniel Sprong doesn't just have the most careless giveaway in the offensive zone inside the blue line on the power play which Pittsburgh went down and scored on Alex Lyon makes a single save that game even on plays where someone else let him down that was a st- Dinker from Alex Lyon. And you hate to really rip on the guy because he's pulled together a lot of great games. And especially since he's rebounded his form of of late, he's the reason why Detroit's been able to kind of scrounge together any points recently. One of the reasons. But he just didn't make a single save that game. Like there was, I I don't even want to look at what Pittsburgh's expected goals were because it cannot have been six. There's just no way it was six. 
there were one or two goals that you could excuse and the rest should have been stopped by an NHL caliber goalie. Right from the get-go in the game, the first goal of the game might have been the worst of them. And it was a sign of things to come. There were really good storylines. First off, Lucas Raymond and Dylan Larkin pretty much together probably saved the Red Wings season by securing one point because, you know, the giveaway happened, because the missed call happened, because Lyon was terrible that game. Pittsburgh was up 5-3 in the third. And Detroit needed to, with under 10 minutes left, get two goals. And between Larkin and Raymond, and Raymond, his was for the hat trick, were able to do it. So the scoring went like this. Pittsburgh went up one nothing. Lucas Raymond scored to make it 1-1. It was a, a on the backhand. Nice play to finish. Great play by Debrinket to yeah. get that rebound for Lucas Raymond. He stripped the defenseman in the corner and fired a bad angle shot that ended up right on Raymond stick. Yeah, Debrinket has been doing, we've talked about this, that even when he's been doing well, he just hasn't been scoring, but he's been doing a lot of things right and, and making a lot of good plays. Three assists game for Debrinket, which was great to see him rewarded that way. And then Chris Letang made it 2-1. Lucas Raymond again for his second goal, this one from Debrinket and Larkin as well. That was also a nice back and forth with Debrinket. Debrinket actually probably looked like he thought he was going to get the puck back, but Raymond cut in again on the backhand to bury it. And then that's when it started to get a little bit out of hand. You know, 3-2 at the hands of Crosby, and it was just a dime from Russ to him, and then Russ scored to make it 4-2. And at that point, even though the Red Wings, you know, Lucas Raymond with a couple goals, Sider also did a good job on, on the one goal to step up and keep that play going. And Dylan Larkin got his 500th point, and you're like, okay, the Red Wings' best players are showing up, and we've talked a lot about their depth has been disappearing of late, so they need their best players to show up if they're going to have a chance. You saw that, but then at, at 4-2, you thought, ooh, it's, you're not seeing what you want from Lyon, for example, who was facing backwards in his net at one point. And you're like, yeah, that's the kind of game we're going to have. And then who else other than Jeff Petrie? Forget the, the missed call on Raymond where they tripped him and then went and scored. Forget for some reason where Sidney Crosby did an actual Greco-Roman wrestling move on Ben Schrott and they got offsetting penalties. Forget all that. Who else but Jeff Petrie to make it 4-3? That should have been saved, that shot, probably. Probably. There was a lot of traffic, but it's one you hope the goal That's a real get. goal scorer's goal. Look, man. You know, we, we talk about just win behavior. That means accepting the Jeff Petrie third goal of the season is going to be one of the most important ones. And that allowed the Red Wings to at least be within sight getting into the third period. Assist to Sprong and Sider. The 5-3 goal from Jeff Carter in the third, that one was tough. That one was, is, again, where we thought, yeah, is this out of reach? And then more of Raymond and Larkin putting the team on their backs. Larkin scoring the goal to make it 5-4 and Lucas Herman doing a great job to win that battle and win the puck and getting it to Larkin in front. Those two, you understood, were taking over the game for Detroit at that point. And then Raymond from Larkin and Debrinket, a two-on-one where Larkin found Raymond. Raymond did a great job to finish to make it 5-5 with about five minutes to go. The the conversation and discourse about, you know, where the Red Wings depth has been and, and as the team has been kind of struggling, who has had to step up. And we said it has to be Detroit's best players because it's kind of like a top down foundation, if that makes sense, because the, the depth just hasn't been doing it since March. This game was like a microcosm of that. It was Lucas Raymond hat trick. Dylan Larkin, you know, 500th point factoring in on all of this. Alex Debrinkit with three assists. Even if he wasn't finding the back of the net, he was a big factor in the game. That's the kind of thing that you needed. And the timing was perfect. Yeah, that line has been carrying the last few games in terms of chances, in terms of who's controlling the play, in terms of actual goal scoring. You know, I talked last episode about how the Red Wings had a depth scoring problem, and my mentions were blooded after that one about do you know how many 10 goal scores the Red Wings have so I went and I looked I want to see I wanted I genuinely wanted to see if I was just plainly wrong about the Red Wings depth scoring dropping off and I checked I went back to when this kid started six weeks ago March 1st how many Red Wings had more than three goals you know goal every other week trying to be generous here three Larkin Raymond Kane and my thought going into the third period because I 
I brought this up on Twitter at the second intermission was this is going to be tough for the Red Wings to come back from because this top line can only do so much. I was wrong. <laughs> they did not, not about the depth scoring problem. That's still a gigantic issue. That top line can solve a lot of these problems by themselves, and they did. And spoiler for the Toronto game, that theme continued. But it was huge, 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 huge. That shorthanded Jeff Carter goal early in the third period, most important game of the season against a team you're fighting with, that's a textbook. Sucks the life out of your bench. Yeah. Absolute deflator. And then to come back and still tie it after that, again, on the backs of Raymond and Larkin and to brink it, you know, all the credit in the world to them. They don't get enough attention around the league for what they've been doing, even when the rest of the team has fallen off. More of that goal in a moment, but Lucas Raymond. I mean, before they lost in overtime, we were all talking about, I think you made the joke, like, get Lucas Raymond his eight-year extension right now. This was another game where Lucas Raymond showed why he is at a bare minimum a star and he has a potential to be even more in this league. He's still just, what, 22 years old? Like, this guy is taking over games. He's taking over games, and that's the difference. Like, you can have the talent to score a lot. You can have the talent to produce. And Raymond has shown that in previous seasons. But this year, he's shown how he's been able to take over in big moments. He's been able to, to, you know out-muscle players for key plays. He's been able to get to the soft spots. He's been able to convert on opportunities. It's been in a myriad of ways and in pretty much every facet of his game where you've seen him improve. And that all adds up to he's taking over. In a game where you have, I think it was Larkin who said this, but in a game where you have Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin and Chris Letang and Eric Carlson on the other end of the ice and you were the best player on the ice, like it, it sounds like you're trying to write a storybook here, but... That's the kind of stuff you look for for guys who can be game breakers. And uh, I think we're seeing flashes of that and a lot of promise for for Raymond to ascend from, you know, an even higher level than just like a, a run-of-the-mill star, which is already a fantastic result early in his career. Lucas Raymond deserves all the hype. And it's almost a shame. Well, it's a big shame that the Red Wings lost that game in overtime. But the story should have been that he single-handedly almost, with Dylan Larkin and Alex Dabrinkit's help, he saved that game. And, and with that point, the Red Wings season. Yeah, and looking at where the standings sit now, it's the only hope they had. If they were even one point lower than they are now, the math, the odds, the statistics, whatever, changes dramatically and not in the Red Wings' favor. They would have very few scenarios where they could even make the playoffs right now. And after they lost, everyone was like, oh, yep, that, that slides out. But the Capitals also lost, and the, the Red Wings got a point, and so that was enough to keep them in it. Washington, Pittsburgh, two biggest games of the season in terms of those are your direct competitors for the wild card. Detroit walked away with one of four points and we're still in it. If you want to know how we're not making it up that this playoff race is wacko, some people have said this is just what playoff races are. No, it's not. You don't get one of four points against the two teams that you're tied with in this playoff race and then walk away with higher probability than them after the weekend. Like that, I'm sorry, no, that's bizarro land. Well... That's the Eastern Conference for you. But you know what? It's credit to everyone who's been making fun of us saying this is the most important game of the year or it feels like must win. They're like, well, no, not really. And you know what? They ended up being right because it's the next one. (laughs) They haven't been winning and it's been working. The next one was must win. The next one was if you're going to have a realistic chance, you have to walk away with at least a point, if not two here. Hold on. Because of the results that happened in the afternoon in the NHL with the Eastern Conference, this was the first game that was statistically a must win at least must get a point yeah must not lose yeah must not lose so the red wings against toronto that first period was a dream like 4-1 after the first and in a game where toronto really like they they had all the momentum they you knew that austin matthews was going to try to score two goals to get to 70 and they opened scoring and you thought oh what kind of game are we going to get here from from James Reimer and Detroit sold out. They minimized shots against, and they were able to score four times in the first period. Alex to scoring twice massive. He has been too streaky this year. The production, even though the numbers overall are, you know, within range of what we said is probably to be expected from him. It's still been not consistent enough and not at timely moments, but we talked, his game has been improving and I was actually, I was able to make it down to Detroit and, and I was on TV 20 with uh, Gina and Brad Galley and Justin Abdelkader was in studio as well. 
and like we had a segment on Alex Dabrinkit, and we said like he's been doing the right things, which is why he had that three assist game. You just want him to find the back of the net, and that was amazing timing. His two goals, the first one, great pass from Lucas Raymond. He had Raymond did well to sell shot there until the very end and get the puck over to Dabrinkit. And Dabrinkit did good to fire at home. And I know that sounds basic, but that's what he's not been doing recently. So that was a huge, huge first goal for him. Yeah, anything to get the confidence going in a goal scorer is a huge plus. It's a shot that Samsonov probably should have stopped. It was a great pass from Raymond, but Samsonov was there. Mm -hmm. He was pretty well squared up by the time Dabrinkit shot it. But that's what we've been saying with Dabrinkit. You know, he hasn't been getting burying his chances, but also he's had a lot of posts and bad luck go his way. So he finally gets one to squeak through just over the pad, posting in one again, not likely to go in most of the time, but it finally drops for him. You're sitting there going, okay, that was the break he needed. Please let the floodgates open now. And that's what it was. Not that two goals is floodgates, but when you hadn't scored in your past eight or whatever it was, the third of Detroit's goals were also uh, was also from Alex Dabrinkit. And that was, he was just in the right place at the right time on the power play. Robbie Fabry centered it to Confer. Confer shot. The puck popped out to the left side, and that's where Dabrinkit scored. Again, confident enough to fire at home and confident enough to at least open those gates a little bit. And that was Robbie Fabry's 200th point as well. The fourth goal of the period was David Perron just throwing the puck on the net. And that's definitely not a shot that should have been let in, which is a theme really of the game. But... That was Detroit really piling it on, and it turned out to be a key goal. But I skipped over the second goal on purpose because Simon Edmondson reminded all of us that he is not just you know a big defenseman with good reach and, and improving gap control and being able to make stops at the blue line. No, no. This man was drafted for his soft hands and offensive touch, and that's what he demonstrated on that goal. And a 10 out of 10 Selly. Oh, yeah. That was amazing. He's He's... Like on the ice, he's a pretty soft-spoken guy. Like he, he's not too. He's Swedish. Yeah, <laughs> he's not too out there. But man, that was a that was a fun silly. I, I'm I'm happy to see him enjoy that moment. You drop to one knee to rip one top corner, and then you just keep it flowing and throw the arms up. Ten out of ten, no notes to do it in Toronto's barn too. Yeah, even better. The pictures. I don't know which of the the photographers that was. The Red Wings, the entire Red Wings, like media and, and photography and video and graphics team, do such an amazing job. But that picture of him, like arms up, was glorious. I was so happy to see him use it on the socials everywhere. Great play with Edvinson. That uh, that play kind of started and ended with him. Perron factored in as well. Petrie got the secondary assist, but Edvinson's first goal of the season, timely one. We've been talking, he's only been in big moments really for the Red Wings since he's been up again and awesome to see him reward it. Yeah. And then the second period, hmm. Detroit up four one, you know, their strategy up until that point was minimize shots against. They didn't get a save with Lyon. And in that second period, it looked like you were going to get a full 60 minutes if you're not going to get that from Reimer either, because he just kept losing his net. I'm not saying Detroit was perfect in front of him. I'm not saying they didn't take dumb penalties, but Reimer's swimming. Well, we knew that's what kind of game it was going to be because you skimmed past the opening goal in the first period from the Nylander to Marner cross-ice pass. And the reason that Marner shot got through Reimer was because Reimer fell outside the top of the crease and didn't even track the puck over to Marner. So he had an entire empty net to stare at. Yeah. And you thought maybe... Maybe that was so bad, it'll kind of wake him up and he'll settle down and play a little calmer in the net. Nope, that did not happen. And you immediately thought of, oh, Vili Husso, who was down in Grand Rapids and who was poised to make a start or at least factor, like, you know, get his conditioning stint in again, took warm ups, left warm ups early, wasn't going to play. That guy seems to be fighting. Whatever his injury bug is this season, it's not projecting well. And I don't think it's unfounded fears to say what's Vili Husso's future in terms of his health and will the offseason be enough? And and then you're like, well, then what does Detroit have to look forward to? Because the the prevailing opinions have been Detroit either needs to go get help in terms of a high-end goaltender or Detroit needs to just trust the fact that Lyon and a healthy Husso next season will be enough. And right now, <laughs> you don't know. Anyhow, that's that's later content but 
Yeah, it was Robertson, and then Matthews scored his 69th goal of the season. Nice. On the power play, and then John Tavares, it was 4-4. There were other opportunities as well. Matthews almost scored, made it 70. At that point is when we were thinking, the way this game is trending, it's not looking likely for the Red Wings. Yeah, it was funny. I was with a fellow Red Wings fan and a Leaf fan when the Wings went up 4-1, and the Leaf fan turned to me and said, well, looks like you guys are going to get that win you needed, and I went, you must be new here. <laughs> the Leafs are like, we've got them right where we want them. Well, one of my friends who is a Leafs fan said, as someone who has had to rely on James Reimer for a th- strong third period in the past, I'm very sorry. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> I like Prashant's tweet in the late in the first period of, Detroit's strategy of not letting the puck within five feet of James Reimer seems to be paying off. They were no longer able to enforce that in the second period and... 4-4. Four, four. And it's tough. Like Toronto is a talented team and Toronto's a team that's, you know, goaltending questions aside, they figured out a lot of their game as the season has gone on and Austin Matthews is playing heart level hockey. So it's tough to how are you going to keep that talented of a team away from your goalie when you don't have a superstar level defense for 60 minutes, you know? So you, you don't even want to fault the Red Wings. It almost seemed inevitable. Thank goodness for the the four goal first period. And then you know what? For as much as I was heavy on Reimer, he made the requisite, like the necessary sufficient amount of saves to get them to overtime. In the corporate world, that's called the bare minimum. Hey, if it's enough to keep your job. <laughs> the bare minimum. That's almost literally what that means. And it's not like the Red Wings made it easy in front of him. Patrick Kane, you know, at one point took a double minor high sticking penalty on which Toronto scored. And in the third period, towards the last three minutes of the period, Patrick Kane took another high sticking penalty, one that was careless against Max Domi. And I thought, Patrick Kane, please, no, I cannot handle like some BS narrative on how Patrick Kane quite literally cost the Red Wings the season because if they lost that game in regulation, that would have been their playoff hopes officially done. And then thank goodness for one, the Red Wings, that was the most important penalty kill of the season. They, all the saves that they needed to make, all the clears that they needed to make, whatever. And then Max Domi. Thank goodness for his tripping penalty against Alex to bring it to put the Red Wings on the power play late on the game. Detroit almost ended it in regulation. I almost had a heart attack. Oh, the chance with, what was it? The Larkin spinorama with about three seconds left on the clock from the slot. And then I forget Perron had the rebound. That puck gets up another two inches. We're not even getting to overtime. I was in Detroit. Ken was in Toronto and I heard him like in, <laughs> not even over the broadcast. And then in overtime, Dylan Larkin, you know, redeems himself for not scoring in overtime against Pittsburgh because he had a point blank chance against Pittsburgh that he didn't convert. He converts it and Patrick Kane redeems himself for the six minutes of high sticking penalties for getting that puck on Larkin's stick and Larkin like that. That goal was just I don't care how unpretty it was. It was so monumental. The Red Wings didn't even know at that point on the bench that they had saved their season by getting into overtime, apparently. But you they knew the impact of that that goal and how important it was to get those two points. It, look at the still image of them celebrating. Lucas Raymond is approximately seven feet tall because he jumped that high. Dylan Larkin did his best Sidney Crosby golden goal celebration. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Like my heart rate variation was probably bigger that day than any other day of my life. You should get a whoop. Uh, I mean, you should get a un- <laughs> unnamed product <laughs> you know that monitors your sleep and stress levels. You should get one. You should wear it during golf and wear it during a game and say and ask us to figure out which one's which. That's actually you guys would have a tough time. Anyhow, that's overtime content. That's okay, really, yeah. perfect, perfect. Two points. Somehow an even more electric game than Lucas Raymond's hat trick four point heroics in the game before. They they lose. They pick up one point of four against Washington and Pittsburgh, and then they pick up two against Toronto, who at one point erased a 4-1 deficit. I'm just here for the ride, man. Just win is, hashtag just win is is all you need. You joked before the podcast, because we said Reimer was so terrible in the second, but then did, you know, what he needed to after that, and that is the embodiment of just win hockey. OT win, I'll take it. This entire game was a microcosm of everything about the wing season. Head start, blow it, you're not happy going into overtime, but you're just happy to be there. Are we upset at that moment in time? Yeah. Again, about being there? No, we would be very happy taking to Toronto to overtime at any point this season because that feels like an accomplishment. But it's how we got there. 
That was so disappointing. Could we trust a save at any point? No. No. Do we get any depth scoring? No. Except from the defenseman who we were yelling should have been up the whole season. <laughs> it was the wing season in a game. And it was beautiful. And expecting anything else at this point, and I say this to myself a lot of times, it's like expecting anything but this kind of chaos over any game from the end of March onwards is insanity because this is the, what the Red Wings have demonstrated that they are. And you have to try to ride this to the playoffs, that this is who the Red Wings are. And if they win, it has to be on the backs of randomly picking whichever one of their goalies isn't going to completely crap the bed or, or do it less that night. And then hoping that between your best players carrying you and then whatever other depth shows up, that's enough to to win that game. So we all need a good sleep after this. But that's that's for later. The Red Wings get the two points. The regulation versus overtime doesn't matter at this point. Uh, there's a very narrow path where that tiebreaker again. It's if the Islanders come into play that matters. Two points is two points. The Red Wings did fantastically to do it. Larkin with his OT goal. That was his ninth career OT goal, tied with Eisenman and Shanahan for second most in Red Wings history. Sergey Fedorov has twelve at first, but that was Larkin already has nine of those, which is wild. Also, Mo Sider, I mean, we, we haven't talked a lot about him. I mentioned that he made a good offensive play in the previous game, but he had eight hits and two block shots. I think Ice Hockey Gibbs posted this. Eight hits and two block shots. He is the first player to hit 200 in each of those categories, 200 hits and 200 block shots or more in the season since Mike Komisarek in 07-08. Like, Mo Sider has been asked to completely change the way he shows up for this team this season because he's like the only guy who can play defense right now. He's doing what Lucas Raymond is doing on offense, but on defense and for the entire season, and he doesn't have a Larkin to also help with that. He's doing the work. If it doesn't show up in the stat sheet in the prettiest ways or, or you know, he's at the bottom of the game score sheet for whatever game, he's also doing the work there. Again, he's getting the Ice Pack sponsorship the Advil sponsorship, the Tylenol sponsorship, whoever wants to reach out. He's got to be the face, the spokesperson for the brand. The highs and the lows, man. Like Raymond Hattrick sprung devastating giveaway after being scratched for giveaways and, and not being responsible with the puck. Larkin's OT goal, you know, blowing the 4-1 lead. The, the goalies just either making a save somehow or, or completely letting everything in. This is, you can't say this isn't entertaining. It's... Like I said, I will take this any day over the prospect profiles into the third round at this point. Okay, more on the Red Wings and the rest of the NHL in a moment, but first we're going to take a break to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by Labatt Blue Light. Created in 1983, this premium light Canadian Pilsner is a delicately balanced beer brewed with Cascade hops and a blend of malt. It's fresh, crisp, and brewed to the highest quality standards. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. And when you do share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. So next time you're watching a hockey with your buds, be sure to share a Labatt, because while you might not all root for the same team, although we on this podcast do hope you're rooting for the Red Wings, you can all enjoy a Labatt Blue Light. We honestly love going to games in Detroit and seeing Labatt being the beer that fans clamor for all over the arena. It's a reliable beer and great to have in your hand when celebrating a goal. So head to the link in the description of this episode or the one you see on your screen to find Labatt in stores near you today. You must be 21 or older and as always, enjoy responsibly. All right, welcome back. In more Red Wings news, as we cover a couple other things before we get into Arizona slash Utah and the rest of the league. Uh, there was a little bit of discourse recently on, you know, Patrick Kane, and he was asked about returning to the team. He gave a, a pretty standard, like he plays everything close to the chest, like non-answer. So I, I think at this point in the season, it's too early to to try to glean anything from his words. Like it, it's just a fool's errand, and you're basically arguing over thin air. So I don't think it's time yet to to really talk about that. And I also think the way these last two games play out could also inform on a lot of what Kane sees in the future of this team. And then as we head out to the WHL, Nate Danielson uh, has five points in two games in the next round of that playoff. So he continues to be a factor for the Portland Winter Hawks. So we'll be monitoring his progress as those uh, WHL and CHL playoffs continue. Evan, 
Ryan. The Arizona Coyotes are no longer a team. Not officially yet, but in practice, like we all know that this last game in Arizona is going to be their last game in Arizona. What was the straw that broke the camel's back this time? You left, and they said mm. it would be really funny to do this while Evan was gone. Pretty much what happened, just to recap, is the NHL didn't have confidence in Arizona's land auction buy and the timing for the arena deal and all this, and they had a backup plan, which very rapidly moved into no longer a plan, and this is the path we're going down. It has all but been confirmed, even if the Arizona Coyotes put a weird cryptic message out where you can still see the cursor flashing bar on the screenshot of a a, a message which is <laughs> can't even begin to talk about how bush league that is up until like 24 hours ago their pin tweet was still like this video that was trying to trash talk everyone saying arizona was leaving and it's like we're committed to hockey in arizona and we're here to stay or something like that it's like no you guys are going to utah it's the owner's son having access to that account is like the funniest thing in the Anyhow, Arizona's going to Utah. This last game there is, the again, the last game that Coyotes fans are going to see from this specific franchise. Have you seen what those tickets are going for? Thousands. Yes. Well, I mean, there's only like 40 of them to sell, right? This is fair. And it's the last game at Mullet Arena before they're going to transition to Utah. Players are pissed. Players found out at the same time as a lot of us found out, which, I mean, just can't be happening this way. It's unsurprising. Like we talked about this at the same time as, you know, we said this last, 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 last chance of Morello bidding on this land auction in Arizona and developing the arena deal. Like that was, uh, it was way too optimistic to be certain. And even if they did it, it was such a long path, like playing at Mullet Arena for however many more seasons, it would have been insane. The NHL might have done it because they've been insane for this for so long, but they they had convinced the team in terms of the players and the fans and a lot of media as well, that this is actually what they were committed to. But when they had a billion dollar offer for a franchise that doesn't even have a home right now, and the Ottawa Senators just sold for less than that, that money was always going to talk. And that was always going to be the out. Morello gets to cash out for however much profit. The hockey ops side are moving over, but the business side, a lot of those people are going to lose their jobs, which is like, what you expected, but exceptionally sad in this case. Fair, there's no such thing as fair in this business world, but that sucks to see the fans lose their team and players are going to have to uproot and move. This is different than being traded. Like they never thought that they were going to go to Salt Lake City. I mean, Utah, pretty cool place to live by all rights for a lot of different reasons. And, and I think they have a lot of the same things to offer as Arizona, but what a mess where Morello walks away with a big profit and also a clause to potentially secure a future team. I love the report that came out uh, from Friedman that NHL owners are actually pissed about this, saying he doesn't deserve this and they're angry he's getting all this money. And obviously they'll get, whatever, $10, 15000000 million out of the deal themselves. So I think they'll be able to swallow their pride on it. But, yeah, garbage owner runs garbage franchise, treats everybody like garbage on the way out, gets a huge payday. Do you remember this story where they weren't paying their bills? Uh, their rent previously for their old arenas, which they got kicked out of. This, Among other things. This season, the Arizona Coyotes weren't paying their hotel bills to the point where the hotels that service the league, like around all the NHL cities, banded together and started demanding upfront certified checks from the Arizona Coyotes, upfront payment instead of just invoicing them because they were like, we can't, you need to pay us. The NHL had to call Morello and Gutierrez and say, pay your bills like that is unserious bush league behavior that's like the fifth instance of them being cheap at such a raw basic level and then you get the flip side of like utah you have ryan smith over there who wants to do you know what florida and tampa have done which is really commit to making the amenities and the services and all of the facilities around the team for the players just top notch spend money on making it a great experience for the players and their families. He wants to spend on the team itself. Like I will, there's a lot of big name free agents out there. A lot of people's first thought was, okay, if he's going to spend is that, is he going to give a heap of cash to Steven Stamkos? What about Reinhardt? Like a lot of these names have been floating around and I don't think that's been wrong to do because this is just better for the players. All of the, the crappy stuff aside, it's better for the players and it's better for the league. 
Absolutely. The fans get a raw deal here, but it's just moving from unserious cartoon league to, okay, this is a real franchise that is actually getting the attention and the, the financing it deserves. And yet the cartoon league that this is has set this deal up so that if Alex Morello gets an arena in the next five years, I believe it was, he gets an expansion team in Arizona again. So we, the circus gets to start all over again. The thing is, I think those stipulations are set up in such a way where it's, it seems pretty unattainable. I think they're re- reasonable, but this is not a reasonable person who, in a best case scenario, will not be capable of doing it. Do you have, given the track record of the Arizona Coyotes, do you think there's any possible way that the Arizona ownership group can get their act together in time before those clauses expire? I think that's the bet. Gary Bettman is making that he won't. And if there's anyone who knows the Arizona Coyotes the best, it's Gary Bettman. <laughs> that's his uh, That's his pride and joy right there. It's, it's funny because the league owners hate them. The fans in Arizona hates this ownership group. If, if hockey is to come back to Arizona, which I think it will, the, the fan, no one's going to want to accept this ownership group being back in the fray. Which is why my prediction actually is that for the first time ever, Morello spends the money and gets, you know, the job done to build the arena because that is the most like evil villain, annoying thing that will only ever happen to the NHL situation possible. And then he initiates this uh, clause where but in 2028, for example, he initiates an expansion because he has the arena ready and then Arizona comes into the league and so does, you know, Houston or, or wherever else. Because that would be absolutely be the worst case scenario. And not that Arizona fans deserve that, but that's just what the NHL has just lived through the last however many years. This is where the Doomer humor is appropriate because I'm with you. I think it actually probably will happen because one, the NHL rightly recognizes how big of a market this is and they don't want to abandon it completely. They also recognize that he has all the leverage here. They needed this team the hell out of Arizona yesterday. And if they wanted to do that and they wanted to get the new good ownership group involved and the new market in Salt Lake City, they had to make Morello happy in order to make the sale go through. So he got to dictate basically all the terms. Now, one of the terms was if he does get an expansion team, he's given that billion dollars back. That's the cost. Yeah. So he's not walking away from that with a huge profit. It would be in that sense of break even, which fair, that makes a ton of sense. But yeah, I don't think the NHL wants that to happen. I think they want this five-year window to come and go. And then in year five and a half, give it to some other owner in Arizona. Keeping the litigation out is also important. Like The, the league just doesn't want to be tied in a legal pedal here, but... We'll see. Uh, there have been nothing's finalized, which is why so much of this is still speculative. And a lot of that, like being touchy around it, is because Morello holds so many of those cards and could at any point just blow this up with lawyers and whatever. But there have been conversations about are they going to just deactivate the team and Ryan Smith buys, you know, assets, which is the contracts and, and hockey ops stuff, and then activates a brand new franchise. So it is de facto an expansion. And then, you know, he doesn't get the trademark and that way the Coyotes stay in Arizona for a potential future expansion. So if hypothetically Morello does get that expansion team, it's going to still be the Arizona Coyotes. That's one way to do it. I don't know what the legalities are behind that, but it would be interesting to see if that's the case. Regardless, uh, this doesn't seem to be one of those scenarios where, oh, it's a free for all for all of the best players in Arizona and Detroit can just scoop them up for cheap or free. Utah is going to be smarter than that. And I, I won't, they're going to probably try to be the same as, you know, how Vegas is doing it. Like go balls to the wall right from the start, which is, I mean, cool to see. We talked last episode, Brad, if you're in a non-traditional hockey market, you got to put in work to, to make it attractive for the players and players like Vegas players like Florida teams. Now, like it's, it works, but you have to put in the time and the money doesn't hurt when you're the first two so you get a or one of the first so you get the fan base rallied around him like vegas did yeah yeah that also helps in a big way anyhow that's going to keep progressing evan if you leave again more crazy stuff will happen what other team will move yeah maybe you have to do like abandoned dunes trip this time twist my arm yeah it'll be it'll be tough unfortunately we won't be able to finance that how far is jackson hole from salt lake city 
we flew in from or to Jackson Hole from Salt Lake City, and it was about half hour flight. You see, the thing is, Ryan, none of these places are real. I didn't know where Jackson Hole was. It's not you real. Could, you could have thrown a dart at the USA map, and I would have been like, yeah, that makes sense to me. But it felt like a that part of the country vibe, and I know that's like Evan's vibe. So the fact that, that I was actually that close is not surprising at all. It's, it's all fake. It's not real places. It's from a cartoon. All right, some news from across the NHL. Tampa Bay had Noah Hannafin stolen from them, straight up. Stolen from them at the trade deadline, and they thought they might get him in free agency, and now he is stolen because Vegas has done a good job convincing him he is signed for eight years at $7.35 million per year. Good. Good. Keep him out of division. <laughs> yes. Bad things happening to Tampa. Terrific. Big fan. Thank yeah. you, Vegas. Yeah. And again, I, I'm hinted at it in the Utah conversation, but the Stamkos conversation doesn't seem to be going very positively right now. Tampa's a smart organization. They know how old he is. They know how aging curves work. <laughs> Evan, are you going to have a really fun summer with me talking about Stamkos to Detroit rumors just to piss Brad off for a long time? Uh, he'll go to Edmonton. Kenny Holland will be kicking tires on oh us. Oh, my God. <laughs> you can't give me PTSD. It's Master Sunday, man. I'm going to try. Elsewhere in the world of hockey, Denver. Denver wins the national championship under coach David Carl again. Shai Booyam wins his second national championship. That was their second in three years, sandwiching uh, Quinnipiac's win last year. But holy, that program is unreal. And uh, the question everyone's asking is how long until David Carl's an, an NHL coach? First of all, I'm rattled that this is our second take on this because you're not going to admit that David Carl being in his mid-30s is young this time around. <laughs> I will, but I'll say again. He's not on the ice, Brad. Neither am I. He's doing a very immobile job, so. I haven't moved in this chair in an hour, so are we really that different? You and David Carl, yeah, I would say profoundly. I would say he's <laughs> actually quite successful in life and people really like him, so. If I was better looking, smarter, knew more about hockey, we're basically the same person. And he was also a phenomenal hockey player, just, you know, had an unfortunate end to his career. That too. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just change all of that. <laughs> yeah, if we just change everything fundamentally. No, but he's going to have an NHL job as soon as he wants it. Not everybody wants to jump out of college hockey because it's a pretty sweet gig for college coaches, honestly. But most guys who have his track record do make the jump eventually. And for how he's done, he'll be able to do it almost whenever he wants. He controls his own destiny at this point. That was a, a name that a lot of people brought up. I remember Prashant's article that he wrote about potential Red Wings coaches. Like he was in there. He's going to get some offers soon. I think the next time the NHL goes outside of their their coaching, you know, carousel, he'll be one of the top names in there. There's only so much more you can do. And we haven't even talked about Shai Booyam's brother, Zeev, yet. But he's going to be a top pick in this year's draft. You know, obviously going to be a much higher pick than Shai Booyam was. Those brothers, like, he's, that kid's going to be exciting. And when we're doing prospect profiles relative to the Red Wings, he's probably not worth mentioning because he is not getting to the Red Wings pick. Yeah, he's going to be moving really way likely back. top 10. Some things are going to either the Red Wings are trading picks or, you know, we're not going to talk about what would happen over these next two games. And then we're not going to get into all that. But yeah, good for Denver. Fantastic program what they're doing over there and, and just stacked with a history of success and they just added more to it. And then elsewhere in the world of hockey, Montreal and Boston are look to be the two cities hosting the four nations cup, which is like the prelude to what will eventually be a full suite of world cup of hockey in the future. The world cup has never been consistent. So I'm not going to say it's going to happen for sure, but it's going to happen between Montreal and Boston. All right. Why don't we jump into Overtime? Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you want to support the show. The giveaways, the Overtime bonus episodes, the Discord are some of your benefits. You allow us to produce this show and make it bigger and better. You allow us to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation. And you also allow us to produce other great content like Expected by Whom, a show hosted by Prashanth Iyer and Sean Shapiro. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you want to support the show. Corey London questions from our patrons. Corey London says, looking back to the trade deadline, who that actually moved would have benefited the wings the most. I was mildly harsh on Stevie Y for not picking up anyone, but I'm not even sure which pickup moved the needle for anyone in a positive direction. 
Jake Allen. Yeah, goaltender. That I'll go with another Jake. Jake Gensel. Great couple of answers. Yeah. Jake Gensel's the obvious one, like high end offensive player. I mean, not that you needed to, if you really understood how Jake Gensel's game worked, it's not like you needed to see him do well in Carolina as well, but he's a guy who I'm confident giving some term on a contract for because of how he plays the game. And Jake Allen, like, it almost seems silly to say how could you have predicted the Red Wings goalies would go cold and Huso would have stayed perpetually hurt, but maybe you should have been able to predict that. So either one of those. Gensel, I still... I'm in agreement that the Red Wings didn't do it and they shouldn't have done it. Again, the cost wasn't as high as we thought, but he probably wasn't re-signing and he wasn't going to turn them into a cup contender. So keeping, you know, a bunch of B-level prospects in a second round pick was still in their best interest. Jake Allen is signed for next year as well. That would have solved a massive problem for them. And he cost, what, a third round pick? Yeah, Detroit should have a thousand percent done that. Podgy713 says, changing up my question to save my sanity for a day. I didn't grow up playing hockey or skating, but I picked it up after college and I've been doing beer leagues for a couple years now. I do a lot of on and off ice workouts to get up to speed, but I was wondering what your guys' go-to exercises are for things like agility and horizontal movement. I drink a lot of beers. (laughs) Yeah, beer and beer league. (laughs) Before we answer, I want to say I have the exact inverse path because I have picked up golf after playing hockey and now I'm trying to do like golf exercises after doing purely hockey stuff my whole life. But I just rake the leaves a little bit faster, you know, go from zero to a hundred really quick, you know, work on that rotation. (laughs) Oh, you do you mean like come over the top with the rake really aggressively? No, really create that lag with the, with the rake. Oh, that's that was my problem. But you're, you're right with agility and horizontal, you're any explosive exercises are going to be key there. Yes. And no, because there's, fundamental misconceptions with this and i come from both backgrounds in this one so i feel like this is one of the very few questions i'm actually qualified to answer first and foremost is strength all the agility and balance and whatever you know crazy complicated exercises people are doing are useless if you're six foot to 140 pounds the compound strength movements are the most important yes, straight yeah, up yeah. full stop your squats your deadlifts whatever get your strength up Then, yeah, you want to do a lot of isolateral exercises from that point in your progressions, your lunges, your Bulgarian split squats, any variations of those you want to do, because that's where the balance is going to come in. You you get your foundation of strength, then you get your foundation of balance. Once you have those two to a point where you're very comfortable, now you start screwing around with the weird stuff, the really explosive movements, the, you know, more plyometric based movements in your exercise we're, and obviously, throughout this all, you have to be doing a ton of conditioning because that's the most important thing for hockey. But that's where I would start with my focus if you're just getting into hockey and you're looking to get into quote-unquote hockey shape is get your strength, then get your balance. And throughout this whole process, you are really, really working on your conditioning. Those foundational movements, like those foundational compound movements, I honestly think if anyone is doing any strength or even – hypertrophy like they just want to get bigger you need to have those like you absolutely everyone should should be squatting squat until your body doesn't let you do it essentially i also agree with you that everybody should be pronouncing hypertrophy as hypertrophy oh brother i I, no no i grew up (laughs) i did i did a biomed degree there is zero consensus on (laughs) medical terms from prof to prof from scientist to scientist Every version of all of those words exists in my head because my next prof after the previous one would just say it the other way. Hypertrophy sounds way better, and I am running with that. It, you can do it. I promise you, you have the latitude because it's all BS and made up, and there's, as is usually the case in the scientific community, no consensus. Next question here from Frank the Tanks is, with the biggest games coming back-to-back against a Montreal team that is bottom five yet has beaten Nashville, Colorado, and Florida all in the past month, oh my god. What would you stress is the biggest key to walking away with three or more points? I said this to Gina on TV 20. Saves. The Red Wings are what they are. Their best players are their best players. Their defense is what it is. There's going to be variance in that. If they aren't getting the save, it's going to take a miracle, which is what Detroit got against Toronto. They need a save. Yeah. I Do I like the Red Wings top line against a lot of top lines in the NHL. Uh, not not a lot of the time. It's a really good line and it can go punch for punch with some of the big boys, but 
over a two game stretch. Yes, maybe maybe they're not keeping up with the McKinnons, the Barkovs, the McDavid's, the Matthews, etc. Do I like that line better than a top line center by Nick Suzuki? Yes, I do. Very good player, very underrated player uh, everywhere outside of Montreal. But that that's a matchup the Red Wings could and should win. Both teams have some depth issues up front and on defense. Montreal's more to do with age than anything else, but I digress. Good God, the goalies have to show up. Because yeah. Caulfield's going to be shooting. Suzuki's going to get his chances. They have to stay out of the net. All right, next question here. Sandine Pelica's Pet Pelican says, Happy Masters Sunday in honor of the Green Jacket presentation today. Scotty won it? Yes. Uh, I don't hate the guy. He just, uh, you know my take. He's boring. Yeah. Anyhow, he's just too good. My question is this. Which NHL player would earn this year's Green Jacket for the lowest, worst plus minus? This is for you, Evan. You get to try to answer this question. Is it someone on the Red Wings? No. No. Why? How do you both know this? I know the answer, and I don't even. How do you to know this? Me. It's been going around recently. Oh, that. So, so I've been off the internet for a week. <laughs> yes. So, it's, yeah, it's, they, they don't allow phones in Augusta. Uh, so. Forward? Or, can I get forward or defense? Forward. Okay, it's a forward. Uh, I'm not. Am I gonna? Am I gonna get this? You, you should. should. I should. We you gotta, should. We gotta stop doing this. this is freaking me out. I you should, should get yes. this. Yes. That's a lot of hints. <laughs> Did I already ask if it was a Detroit Red Wing or not? Did I ask? It is not. It's not a Detroit Red Wing. Okay. First thing you asked. Oh my god. (laughs) (laughs) I thought I was. Oh, not a Detroit Red Wing. Oh boy. I. I know what hit you want to give him. Don't do it. Don't give me any hints because and I don't. I can't even think of a player now (laughs) who plays in the (laughs) NHL. (laughs) See see that clip where the guy goes to the uh, the woman on the street and says, "Name any woman for five dollars," and she goes, "Uh." (laughs) I didn't know there was money involved. (laughs) I would have studied. If you get this, I'll give you five bucks. Okay. Uh, On top of the hundreds I owe you for the match. Not a Red Wing. Yes. Not a Red Wing, eh? I will go. (laughs) Hmm. I I don't know. I honestly don't know. Okay. Here's one hint I'll give you that's less obvious than the one Ryan wants to give you. I'm trying to think of all the teams with bad goalies. Think of the basement feeders. Yes. Like the true bottom of the barrel so for the people screaming at your speakers right now i'm sorry like the team's gonna see you no you're on a good track that's a good track uh, okay and think of why you're on a good track because it's chicago or red wings former red wings i won't answer that question okay <laughs> oh i don't like this anthony mantha no no, no. okay we're done move us along philip sedina Wow, I was on the right track. Yeah. You were. You were on the right track. Yeah, Philip Zadina is on track to be this year's Green Jacket winner. Minus 44. At least he's nowhere close to the record set by Bill Mickelson, who has a plus minus of negative 82 with the 74-75 Capitals. Get him off the ice. My God. <laughs> to be fair, there was that year of the Capitals, he probably had 10 teammates within like five of him. Samuel Soderholm. Yeah, do you remember that year? Like vividly when you were like, what, 30 years old at that point? Yeah, uh, David Carl and I actually would watch all the games <laughs> together. <laughs> Samuel Soderholm says, thought experiment time with the Wings chasing a playoff spot and not having everything in their own hands. Would you change this season for a season where we were a lottery team with a chance for first overall? You can't convince me. And I like I know objectively in terms of rebuilding, like what's the right answer, what's not. It's probably better to add another top end player. You can't convince me that it's good for this team's best players or my sanity to watch them suck and be a lottery team for another year. So I'll say I'll take this. Even with the ups and downs and and how terrible some points were and how great some, like, I'll take this over being a lottery team again. This year, yes. The mistake to me in terms of, you know, quote unquote, when to hit the gas was last year. I. Would have preferred the Red Wings tumbled further down the standings, had at least a somewhat realistic chance at Bedard. We saw how steeply the draft dropped off after Mitchkov and Leonard, with all due respect to Danielson, who's a great player. But four or five spots lower in the standings last year is a game changer. This year, the experience is worth it, and the draft isn't nearly as deep. Also, have you seen Axel Sandy and Pelicans play of late? Does he have a chance to take a spot next year? He has a chance. I'll, I'll say he could make some noise. I would be a little surprised based on 
the style of game he plays and his size will make it a little tough to – it would be surprising if he was able to translate that in year one, I'll, I'll say. Yes. He might not even be at camp. He might be back in the SHL next year. There have been some reports to say that he they, they could want him there for another season, so it wouldn't be terribly surprising. Talent player who's not massive, right? So he's not going to be on a fast track to the NHL. I'd prefer him in Grand Rapids, but this stupid logjam that has been created might prevent that from happening, and the SHL might be the path to get him bigger minutes. Jonathan Melwish says, is this one of the most Jekyll and Hyde teams in the NHL in the last few years, beating teams above them and playing well against them, but then producing some of the worst performances against the bum teams of the season? I'm going to push back on that notion. I actually don't think so. I think this is like the tightness of this playoff race and everyone like just falling backwards into a potential spot aside. This is the nature of being a wildcard team in the nature of the NHL. Evan will always tell you any team can beat any team on any given night and wildcard teams, they don't play. They're they, wild cards. Yeah. It, it's a great way to describe it. They play down to their opponents too much, and they play up to opponents which are better on paper, and they'll take it to them. So I, I think this is what you have to expect for the next little while for the Red Wings in terms of their, their roster. Like, I think this is just pretty normal for the middle of the pack. We just haven't seen this in so long. Yeah. All right. Moving on here. Next question from Cletus says, making the playoffs seems like our last opportunity to see Kane in the winged wheel at this point. If he does not return next season, who slash are there any candidates to replace him in free agency? Free agency? Jake Gensel. Uh, yes. Would I sign most of them? No. It'll be very hard to replace the kind of, especially the kind of player Patrick Kane is. That is exceptionally difficult. It's why he is so notable around the league. Yeah, because it's the thing you always have to keep in the back of your mind is what is that likely going to cost? Gensel's great, but he's going to be on a seven year deal and he's like almost 30 years old. We're talking about we would give Stamkos at a Stamkos Kane a two or a three year contract in the six to seven million range. I would also give Stamkos that same contract. He would not take that contract. So you're kind of stuck in that. Who are the younger free agents that are worth signing? There aren't many of them. And the older guys who would definitely make this team better, where the Red Wings are at, is that a contract they should be signing? And in almost every instance, the answer is no. Give Walman the Heart says, was this the best weekend for Red Wings prospects since the rebuild started? Performances from Edvinson, Axel Sandy, Pelica, Casper, Danielson, Kosin, Booyam all deserve shoutouts. I'll say this theme this year has been, despite what, if you have overly negative reactions to the Red Wings or you're really concerned about next season, I don't think anyone can deny the Red Wings are better as a foundation in terms of their pipeline than they have been in God, a generation. And that, yeah, it's massive. Yeah, it's it's been a never-ending stream of good news coming out of the AHL junior. And you're, think of how many prospects, key prospects, key picks that they have absolutely whiffed on specifically second rounders over the last three, four years. And it doesn't matter because there's still so much talent there. Yeah. They're like, that's one of those gray areas where you're like, oh, I wish they would have done this different with the draft strategy, but they hit on so many of the important guys that it is, you're still good. Their first round has been very good relative to where they've been picking. You know, even though the trade up for Kosa in hindsight didn't work out better for them, but Kosa is still a great prospect. Would prefer Johnston and uh, Stankovin, but if we reiterate that till the day we die, we will die much earlier. And it just doesn't shake out that way with the with exactly. who the team takes with the trade of pick. Exactly. The style of player the Red Wings like to draft, they wouldn't have picked either of them anyway. But they've hit on almost all their first rounders under Iserman, possibly all of them. So the their many whiffs in the second round don't matter. The Jack Scientist says, talk to me about Marco Casper as a novice in prospect development for hockey. I feel like we've seen great development this year for him to be a regular in the NHL the next couple of years. Am I overhyping him? Regular in the NHL by keeping that as the expectation? No, you're you're right on track. Is he going to be Dylan Larkin? No, he's absolutely not. Is he going to be some elite two-way Selkie candidate like a Sean Couturier in his prime? No. Could he be a very useful second, third line center, everyday regular? Yeah, possibly as early as next season. I maintain what I said at the start of the season. I think Danielson has higher offensive up end, which means like his upside could cement him as a 2C if everything pans out well, like a highest end of his development. 
a little bit more likely than Marco Casper. But if you have Casper and Danielson swapping two, three C, and they're both like really panning out based on their projections, you yeah, you don't have a, a first line Connor McDavid at center, but Larkin, Danielson, Casper, and they're all doing well. That, that's you could be doing a lot worse, which the Red Wings kind of have been at that position for a long time. Stay Fresh Cheeseback says, is it time to move on from Huso if he can't stay healthy? You guys have talked about trades for Gibson or Markstrom. I'm of the mind that signing a cheaper UFA like Lankanen or Copley is the way to go and have a legit 1A, 1B rotation with Hawaii next year instead of riding a not quite starter into the ground. Who would you rather have next year, Kane or Stamco? Stay Fresh Cheeseback. So two questions in there. Okay, so the goalie one, I understand your thought process with getting a 1A, 1B Lankanen Lion. Uh, the reality of the situation is I don't think you can put a one next to either of them with a lot of confidence. And that's kind of what they did this year where in theory, they were going to have a one, a, a one B and maybe even a one C if Reimer bounced back, which obviously was never going to happen, but they thought maybe and lion had his stretches where he was definitely a one, but then he's had a lot of stretches where he definitely isn't. And who, so yeah, I don't think you can trust his health at this point. This is two years in a row now where him missing a very large chunk of each season. And, a lot of the injuries seem to be recurring. I mean, you injure yourself in a warm-up, in a conditioning stint. That's you feel it. for the guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You absolutely feel for him. But we've seen it time and time again with talented goalies who you you see it, you know it, and they just never stay healthy. I mean, Rick DiPietro, first overall pick. People remember him as some joke. He was good, but he could never stay healthy. And, yeah, you can't bank on that. I'm I'm over the era of let's just go see what goalie we can have as a reclamation project and maybe be good. Yeah. Maybe Lincoln in might be good. Maybe Copley might be good. Maybe who might be healthy. Maybe Lions consistent for the full year. Maybe, 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 maybe I'd rather go out and get a guy like John Gibson. Who's not a world beater, but you know what you're getting for a full season, even though he's had his own injury history, but lately it hasn't been too bad. Last one here, Matt McKay says, hey there, gents, what do you think about the asking price for Clayton Keller or Connor Ingram? Would it even be worth trying to get either of them? Worth trying to get? Yeah. Likely to happen? No, because here's the thing. This isn't Arizona anymore. This is Utah. They're going to want to keep their good players. They're going to want to grow. They're not going to be the farm team for the rest of the NHL like the Coyotes have been forever. Okay. Uh, We're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Just a note for you folks, you may have seen me again. uh, The TV20 Detroit has been simulcasting the Red Wings games for these last three games of the season, starting with the last one. They were kind enough to invite us, the Winged Wheel Podcast, to do pre- and post-game coverage. So you might have seen me on the pre- and post-game coverage for the Toronto game. We're going to be doing the same again on Tuesday. So tune in to TV20. Big shout-out to Gina Trotman and Brad Galley. Justin Applicator was also in studio and that entire crew uh, thanks for having us on. So yeah, if you want to watch us on Detroit TV, you can do so. So tune in, especially on Tuesday. Obviously, Monday will be the home game, so they'll be in the arena. But uh, you can see us. If you don't watch on YouTube, it's a chance to see our ugly mugs on the screen. We're going to thank all of you for tuning in. Thank you so much. If you're a new listener, welcome to the show. And forgive our weird emotions. It's been a bizarre season. But still, the Red Wings are in this. And if you're a listener of old, we hope you've been enjoying and that you have really good heart health. To Labat Blue Light, thank you for sponsoring this episode. And to all of our patrons, thank you so much. We could not do this show without you. To all of our name level supporters on Patreon, thank you so very much. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Victor Zetterberg, brand new name level sponsor. Welcome to the show, Victor. Great last name. Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham. Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, the most important game in the last eight years so far, Admiral Matt S. at the Cheesebag Navy, Carl Brutinen, Nanoluski, Carl Provi, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek and Stam, Cider, Dickens, formerly Marlon Winchester, DJ Denton, God Creatives, Give Blood, Fight Probert, Have You Ever Drank Baileys from a Shoe, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kaylin Wood, Marcus, Matt McKay, Matt Keeler, 
Michael Edland, RA, Red Feather Desert Dogs, Ryan 50 Handicap Hannah, Scott Martin, Shane Patch of Perpetual Ads, Skeletor, Scree, and Lube, That's What I Appreciates About You, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, AB, Adam Rose, Axel Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Chuck Buffchest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Baron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor Layton and Corey Prita, Darren Fick, D Boss Snip Show, Derek James, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, James Pridemore, Johnny Page, Jeremiah Dobo, JM Rhapsody, Jogan Rafferty Fan Club, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Known Petrie Truther, The Mexinadian, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Michigan Boy and Avs Country, Norado's Punchable Face, Not Mad, Just Disappointed Wings Fan, O Ophelia, Red Wing Tar Heel, Reed, Steven, The Hodag, The Hat 123, Tom Iserplan, Respector, Wings Fan in St. Louis, Scott, and your second favorite patron. Thank you all so very much. That was our last episode of the regular season. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.